Great, thanks, Emily. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take questions as we go. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat and the questions also, though I'm not 100% sure how well that will work. Um, so you know, feel free, Emily, to interrupt me if it looks like I'm missing something. I um, want to you know, thank everyone in advance for joining us. And yeah, I'm very much hoping to get some helpful feedback from people, um, hopefully some interesting discussion. I'm going to turn my camera off momentarily and turn it back on well, we'll get to a sort of discussion at the end and start sharing my slides. Oops. So yeah, just to start. So um, as Emily mentioned, I work for NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, also, you know, some of this, or pretty much all of the stuff I'll be talking about today is informed by time I've spent on the Scientific and Statistical Committee for the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, but just to be totally clear, I'm in absolutely no way speaking for either of those organizations today. Um, I've also gotten a lot of helpful feedback on some of these ideas from various members of the Pacific SSC. Um, so a lot of the good ideas are probably attributable to somebody else, but uh, the errors and omissions, faulty logic, all that is probably all on me. Um, so with that, you know, probably most of you have heard about uh, the sort of general idea of there being a reproducibility crisis in science. Um, you know, it's been argued that a lot of published results in the scientific literature cannot be reproduced. Um, this seems to affect multiple fields and have multiple root causes. You know, a lot of the sort of prominent um, reproducibility crisis stories you might have seen lately involve um, some be behavioral ecology stories around um, spider behavior. Uh, there have been some questionable publications on microplastics in fish and um, behavioral impacts of carbon dioxide on certain fish. Um, and in some of those cases, you know, there's some sort of indication that actually it might be uh, due to you know, actual misconduct like uh, data fabrication. And so again, to be clear, I'm not in any way suggesting that kind of uh, misconduct or any kind of misconduct or any kind of deliberate intent to deceive here. Um, but I do think, you know, another aspect of the reproducibility crisis in science that I think is worth thinking about as uh, assessment scientists is the idea of what's called, you know, it sort of goes by multiple names. Uh, one of them is researcher degrees of freedom. Another name is p-hacking. Um, and basically the idea here is that, you know, we all sort of learned in our introductory stats class that, you know, if we do a nicely designed experiment and we do the right kind of statistical test, you know, we sort of hope that there's only about a 5% chance when we use our sort of standard p-value of 0.05. We hope there's only about a 5% chance that uh, just random noise or random variation could yield a pattern at least as strong as the one we think we've seen in our experiment. Um, and, you know, that's sort of great in theory. Um, a lot of you may be Bayesians, I am too, but I still think, you know, p-values do have uh, use as a tool, you know, in the sort of context of well-designed experiments. Uh, but where we can get into trouble is where if people start doing multiple tests or if they collect data on multiple response variables and or multiple potential drivers and then just keep doing tests until they find one that pops out as statistically significant. There's also a uh, problem of what's known as hypothesizing after results are known. So sort of picking your test after you've seen what the data is going to support. Um, another issue may just be people perform a lot of tests and only report the one that gives a sort of statistically significant p-value. And so all these factors may mean that we can't really interpret p-values the way we might want to, you know, that they might actually correspond to um, a false discovery rate much higher than the sort of nominal 5%. Um, and another issue, uh, that's sort of related is even if the researchers do everything right in terms of their statistics, you know, if certain journals will only publish results that meet this sort of criterion for statistical significance, there's a concern that what's sort of called publication bias may lead to uh, misleading results from meta-analyses where sort of only the studies showing strong effects get published and the studies showing weak or no effects don't get published. We might, you know, overestimate how strong effects are as a result. And that's led to some, um, soul searching in the scientific community and also some, you know, pretty scary sounding uh, papers. So like there's this one from John Ioannidis, who already makes the claim that most published research findings are false. Um, 
And you know, he points out some of the scenarios where you might expect p-hacking to lead to the sort of most problematic results. And some of the things he points out as potential um, problematic scenarios include things like when you have a greater, greater number and lesser pre-selection of test relationships, which might remind some people of how complicated stock assessment models are and sort of how many choices stock assessment modelers have of what kind of factors they put in their models, uh, what kind of variables they fix versus estimate, what data they include or not. Um, related when there's greater flexibility in design, definitions and outcomes, and also when there's greater financial interest in the outcomes, which you know, again, uh, stock assessments have definite financial impacts at some times. And also we may be more likely to encounter reproducibility problems when there are more teams involved. And again, stock assessments are, also, are often collaborative efforts with you know, a lot of people on the stock assessment team. Um, so, you know, it makes me, well, it makes one wonder, you know, are there opportunities for things like p-hacking in the stock assessment, pro stock assessment process, uh, but also how big of a problem is it likely to be really? So, you know, there's this paper and paper on, along these lines that made people think, you know, sky is falling, things are really bad, you really can't trust the literature. Uh, there have been some more careful follow-up papers, like this one on the left by Megan Head and colleagues, that, you know, did a sort of careful survey of the literature and said, yeah, it does look like p-hacking is fairly widespread, but it does seem like the effect of the p-hacking is probably relatively weak relative to the real effect size being measured. And so her conclusion was that p-hacking happens, but probably doesn't drastically alter the scientific consensuses drawn from the meta-analyses done on that literature. Um, there's another paper by uh, Jager and Leek where, you know, again, found evidence of p-hacking, but their estimate from a survey of the medical literature was that really the result was a false positive rate of about 14%. So worse than the 5% we might hope for, but also not quite the kind of sky is falling um, scenario we might have gotten warned of in that first paper. Um, another thing to keep in mind when I'm talking about p-hacking, um, I really enjoy this take by Simmons et al. in a paper in Psychological Science pointing out that you know, p-hacking is not something that's necessarily done like on purpose or with bad motivations. Rather, you know, as scientists, we often have a motivation to publish as many articles as we can, um, even though maybe ultimately our real goal should not be publication per se, but discovering and disseminating the truth. Um, but then it's just it's really easy to fall into the trap of convincing yourself whatever gives the sort of publishable result that must have been the right path to have taken with the analysis. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily anything that's done with bad intention, but if we're not careful, we can sort of potentially easily convince ourselves to be doing things that we really shouldn't. And so related, so is the question of, you know, what is the motivation of ac academic scientists and, you know, what ultimately are they tasked with doing? And I think we can ask sort of a similar question as either stock assessors or people tasked with reviewing stock assessments and or managers, you know, sort of in charge of implementing the stock assessments. Um, what are our goals and, you know, what kind of motivations might we face that we need to be keeping in mind? And so sort of akin to the pressure for academics to publish what you might call statistically significant results, managers may face incentives and pressures to sort of consider what are the management consequences before accepting and using a particular scientific product. Um, and so a lot of this talk, I'll be talking about uh, scenarios inspired by the Pacific Fishery Management Council, and in particular, the way they prioritize, review, and adopt uh, stock assessments for groundfish. And it's really not my intention to single out the PFMC or their groundfish process as being more problematic than others. I, in fact, I think it's probably um, one of the better processes, but rather it's just, the PFMC is where I have a lot of experience. And then Groundfish has enough assessments going on and does it with sort of enough of an established process that it might actually make sense to talk about sort of large sample expectations. And, you know, there is sort of a fairly reproducible process that you might be able to come up with a somewhat uh, defensible but tractable model of. Um, and so, you know, while I'm going to focus on groundfish, you know, I can certainly point to examples from other fishery management plans within the Pacific as well. Um, I was involved in a review of a re recent anchovy assessment where there was um, a lot of um, debate and discussion about just the inclusion of a single point 
from a survey that people thought was an outlier and that it was an outlier on the low end. And that seemed to cause much more problem or you know, much more concern amongst the re some reviewers than would an outlier that was um, in the other direction. Um, personally, I work on salmon for the most part in my day job. Um, in Sacramento Winter Chinook, we use minimum size limits to try to um, reduce impacts on this endangered Sacramento Winter Chinook, which tends to have a smaller body size than the other Chinook it co-occurs with. Um, we're only able to estimate harvest impacts from tags we recover from fish that are landed for sampling. And so you know, that poses a real challenge where if most of the fish are too small to retain, we'll never see their tags. Uh, we try to get around this by applying an expansion factor to the recovered tags based on you know, what fraction we expect to be landed. But one problem of that approach is that we often recover zero tags which then no matter what multiplier you, you apply to that zero, you still get zero impacts. Whereas every once in a while, we will get a tag which has a huge multiplier that people just throw out. It's like, that's implausible. Impacts can't be that high. And I think we're probably getting biased estimates out as a result of that. Um, the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model, there have been a lot of concern about it over predicting effort in certain areas. Um, compared to, I would say, less concerned about the fact that it's actually underestimating the actual harvest rate of Klamath fish that seems to be the main purpose of that model. And then in the drift gillnet fishery, we again use a ratio, or we used to use a ratio estimator sort of similar to the tag expansion for Sacramento Winter Chinook, trying to estimate how many interactions we had with protected species. And again, when the output was a zero, and then you applied a multiplier to that zero, that didn't seem to cause people much concern. But when we occasionally do have an observation that then gets a large multiplier applied to it to account for only partial observer coverage, um, that tends to cause more concern um, and led to actually the development of a more sophisticated model that did not depend on that ratio estimator. Um, but for the rest of my talk, I'll be focusing on examples drawn from the ground fish fishery. Um, but then also, you know, so, not singling out the PFMC, and also I'm sure this happens in other, not just regions within the United States, but also other countries, but I just don't have the same level of familiarity there. Um, so just a sort of quick crash course in what the PFMC brownfish assessment does, or is hoping to do, is supposed to do. And so there are many more species of groundfish in the realm of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, which this is the entity responsible for management of federal fisheries off of Washington, Oregon, and California. And so there are many more ground fish stocks than we can feasibly assess each year or even sort of each two year assessment cycle. And so as a result, we go through a process each cycle where we select which stocks are we gonna to try to assess this cycle. Then a stock assessment team develops a model. A star panel or stock assessment review panel reviews that panel or reviews that assessment and may propose changes to the assessment uh, structure. Then the scientific and statistical committee reviews the modified assessment coming out of that star panel. And then typically acting on the SSE's recommendation, the council will adopt the resulting stock assessment. Um, in some cases, the, um, there may be a few problems identified that can't be resolved during the course of the star panel. So the assessment may get set, sent to a sort of separate mop-up meeting. Um, also fairly rare, but certainly happens sometimes that there will be further revision of an assessment at the SSE review stage. And so one thing to keep in mind is because there are many more stocks that we can assess, each time we choose to redo an assessment, either within a single cycle or sort of rapidly redo it the next cycle, that means there's some other stock that we're not going to assess. Um, the things that the assessments produce and how they're used, um, one big one is status or what we call depletion, which is an estimate of the current biomass compared to the unfished biomass. There's the overfishing limit, which is you know, the maximum amount of fish we can remove without overfishing. And we typically assume that this has some true but unknown value, and we make just our best estimate of what that limit is or should be. And associated with that OFL, we have a measure of sigma that's meant to capture the scientific uncertainty in what the OFL is. Uh, we use the OFL and sigma to derive an acceptable biological catch which is an amount of allowable catch that's reduced somewhat from the OFL to account for the scientific uncertainty. And we do this via the choice of something called P star, which in an ideal world represents the probability that the ABC we choose is larger than the true 
but unknown OFL we would have come up with if we had perfect knowledge. Um, to so, sort of show graphically what this means is, so we'll do an assessment, um, come up with our current exploitable biomass, that's the BEX in the top right here, um, and we'll determine our OFL by multiplying that exploitable biomass by the exploitation rate corresponding to MSY. And it's one thing to remember that I'll um, revisit in a little bit is um, when the biomass is large relative to MSY, so like when it's close to the unfished level, that actually results in an OFL that is um, higher than the long-term MSY. You know, it's sort of, we're saying it's okay to harvest at the maximum sustainable rate even if in the short term that means harvesting an amount that's not sustainable. Uh, that said, you know, first of all, we do do projections that take into account the expected depletion, so it's not as if that unsustainable MSY is locked in indefinitely or until the next assessment. Um, also, we often don't actually attain the full OFL or even anything close, but still just keep in mind that um, if we assess biomass to be large relative to unfished biomass, that does mean we'll set an OFL that's not sustainable in the long term. Uh, then we reduce the um, OFL by some buffer to get the ABC. And then not really something I'll talk about, but we can make further adjustments um, called annual catch limits or annual catch targets that try to account for either um, things other than scientific uncertainty, but things like allocation among different sectors or just management implementation error where we may not actually achieve the exact amount of harvest we're targeting. Um, so again, yeah, so OFL is the maximum amount we can catch. The ABC gets reduced to account for scientific uncertainty. And then I won't really talk about these ACL and ACTs, but then the way we derive the ABC is, um, again, we apply this buffer to the OFL. And the way we derive the buffer is we assume that um, the ratio between the true OFL and the OFL coming out of our assessment follows a log normal distribution with a log scale mean zero, which means there's a median ratio of one, and then a standard deviation on the log scale of sigma. And then we choose the quantile corresponding to P star to find you know, sort of how many standard deviations away from the mean do we need to go so that there's only a P star probability that the OFL we, or the ABC we choose is larger than the true OFL. Um, and so once we've sort of found how many standard deviations away gets you the P star we want, we then exponentiate that Z score to get the buffer. Um, and so, you know, when we're putting this in practice, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is what are we trying to achieve in fisheries? Or in particular, at least, what are the scientists advising on fisheries? What should they be trying to achieve with the advice they deliver? And so, you know, in an ideal world, maybe we might want to be harvesting exactly the correct single species MSY for every species. Um, I think one that's probably unrealistic from an ecosystem standpoint, uh, but also just as a practical matter, it's probably not realistic to think that we can exactly estimate the MSY. Um, but, you know, similarly, I think it's also unrealistic to think we're gonna prevent all cases of biological overfishing. You know, so there may well, so, you know, there are certainly our systems where we avoid what is sort of legally defined as overfishing. We can avoid catching more than the OFL we establish, but I think we need to accept that, you know, some of the OFLs we, we come up with are going to be too big. And that's just sort of, you know, something we have to deal with. And that's sort of the motivation behind the OFL being buffered down to the ABC. Um, you know, I think in an ideal world, we'd actually probably want to be achieving a multi species optimal yield. Um, that's great. Um, do we have a shared definition of what the factors that go into optimum yield are? And do we know how to achieve that? Probably not yet. Um, and so as a result, you know, at least sort of my straw man is that what scientists advising on assessment, what, what we should be aiming for is coming as close as we can to having a system where there's a P star probability that harvesting the ABC for any given stock will result in biological overfishing. Or in other words, you know, if we do a large fraction of assessments, we expect that a fraction P star of them will come out with ABCs that are higher than they should have been if we perfectly could estimate the OFL. Um, and in the PFM PFMC context, we usually default to a P star of 0 0.45. 
Um, so, you know, sort of in some ways similar to this sort of standard of using P of 0.05 in a lot of statistical analyses. Um, the PFMC will, you, will use P star of 0 0.40 in cases of heightened precaution. Um, they've considered but never used smaller P stars like 0.35. Uh, ICES Atlantic Salmon has an approach that's maybe loosely like P star of 0.25. Um, and so, you know, I do want to say I certainly am fully aware that ACL specification is an issue that you know, I'm not going to get into. Uh, the attainment of ABCs is an issue. It's something that we're working on in terms of reopening some closed areas and other management changes. Um, but you know, I think people can certainly argue, well, maybe it doesn't matter if the ABC is too high because we're probably not going to attain the ABC anyway. Um, and I think that's a perfectly valid sort of management or policy argument. Um, but you know, my perspective is that assessment science is part of a larger process. And so these other considerations certainly have their roles and managers need to think about those aspects too. But from the perspective of delivering scientific advice, I think we do want to try to hold as closely as we can to actually sort of delivering scientific advice that meets the kind of standards implied by the system we're working under. Um, and so, you know, I think there are a few ways we might not be doing that. Uh, one way is the way in which we uh, prioritize which stocks we assess. And so this is a slide I pulled out of a larger presentation on how the stock assessment prioritization works for PFMC groundfish. And you know, this is only one of the many factors that go into the assessment prioritization. But so basically, when we look at the sort of current perception of stock status, we give the highest priority to stocks that have been previously assessed and assessed to be at low biomass. And we give the lowest priority to stocks that have been previously assessed and we assess them to be at high biomass. Um, and then potentially, you know, or at least you know, something I might do a little bit differently, for some stocks that have never been assessed and their status is unknown, we only give those a sort of intermediate score. So even stocks that have um, a perception of high vulnerability, that's this PSA score, but if their status is unknown, those only get six points towards their prioritization compared to 10 points priority for a stock we previously assessed but come up with a low status score. Um, and again, you know, I think there are great policy reasons for doing that, um, but you know, it could be sort of akin to p-hacking to sort of quickly or at least prioritize reassessing just the low status species. And conversely, remember I pointed out that the OFL for a fish that's, or a stock that's estimated to be at very high status relative to unfished, for that kind of stock, we'll actually give it an OFL that's larger than the long-term sustainable yield. And so maybe it's not the best idea to put the lowest priority on reassessing those stocks. Um, but again, you know, if you're not attaining that OFL, maybe it's not such a big deal. Um, Another consideration is it seems like we may sometimes be applying different standards of proof um, depending on what the outcome of an assessment is. And so this is a very uh, involved flowchart that you don't need to fully follow uh, that was sort of proposed back in 2013 when the Pacific Council was first considering the use of what we call data moderate assessments. And so these are assessments that don't include all the same data sources that would go into what we would call a full assessment. Um, and the proposal here was that we would do a data moderate assessment. And if the data moderate assessment gave an output that said spawning stock biomass was high or above the target, we would sort of accept that assessment and move on. And you know, we don't need to worry about assessing that stock again for a while. Whereas if the status coming out of this data moderate assessment was not so favorable, it would set up a lot of complicated choices that basically said at the very least prioritizing reassessing that stock again. Um, and so, you know, having that sort of asymmetric standard of proof, depending on whether the news is good or bad, uh, might have some analogies to p-hacking. Um, but then what really sort of inspired me to come up with the model I'm about to present is work or what happened during the 2021 West Coast groundfish assessment cycle. And so in June of 2021, um, there were 11 assessments that the SSC reviewed of which the PFMC and the uh, SSC you know, endorsed using all 11 of those assessments as they were, uh, but the PFMC said, no, take another look at five of them. Um, and I should you know, acknowledge for, I think four out of those five, they were these so-called data moderate assessments. 
um, that were being viewed with a little bit more skepticism perhaps. Um, but nevertheless, that did seem like an unusually large number of assessments to be asked to take sort of another look at after reviewing. Um, in September, the SSC reaffirmed or affirmed its endorsement for all five of those, but the PFMC requested that four of them be re-reviewed for yet another time. Uh, meanwhile, there was also a LINCOD assessment, or actually two LINCOD assessments in two different areas. Uh, they indicated uh, sort of healthy stock status, and they were both adopted without delay, even though they were coming up with sort of very different estimates of what the biology of the stock was in the north versus south, so sort of very different pictures of natural mortality, very different pictures of productivity. And we had, you know, the STAT and the STAR panel both agreed. Neither model was really capturing key aspects of the population dynamics. Uh, but nevertheless, that assessment was sort of adopted and people have kind of moved on from that with no real uh, concern that I'm aware of. Um, in November, uh, after reconsidering um, some information relative to catchability in one of the surveys, the SSC did recommend using a different decision table for one of those five assessments. Um, perhaps ironically, the one assessment that there was a recommendation to change was actually a full assessment. It was not one of these data moderate assessments that people were worried about. Um, for the remaining assessments, the SFC reaffirmed its endorsement, um, but there was a decision made to combine certain areas or combine multiple areas for certain stocks, which then changed the aggregate status. Um, and, you know, the SSC did sort of note that, you know, in the future, it would be great if we had sort of objective and a priori criteria for making these kinds of decisions about, you know, lumping assessments together or lumping areas together to determine status. Um, and so then this year in June, as we're doing the stock assessment prioritization for the next cycle, the council chose to reassess one of the species that was part of the set of five that were redone. Um, but they did not want to reassess that species coastwide, uh, but only in the areas where its status was assessed to be low. And in fairness, there are differences in, in how much data would be available to sort of newly inform an assessment in those different areas. But you know, it was, you know, it is certainly the case. We're reassessing the low status. We're not reassessing the high status. Uh, LINCOD ranked very low on assessment prioritization, um, even though you know, it was acknowledged that there was something biologically um, worrying about the assessment models. Um, and then there was some discussion, though, it was not ultimately adopted, of having a sort of check-in meeting that might allow canceling an assessment if people were not sort of satisfied with the way it was progressing. Um, and so, you know, I, this just got me thinking, you know, are we at risk of doing some p-hacking here? And so hopefully, you know, it goes without saying, it doesn't take a quantitative model to say that if just favorable and high status assessments are accepted, while just unfavorable or low status assessments are rejected, and I think it's pretty clear that will introduce bias. And I'm not at all saying that we're, you know, we're not doing just that. Although, um, you know, I think we do need to acknowledge that managers do respond to pressures and incentives. And it was interesting when I raised some of these concerns at a ground for a subcommittee meeting, we actually got a comment uh, from a council member who said, from the perspective of a manager and or council member, it is logical to expect that more attention will be given to the more pessimistic assessments. This is consistent with the need to instill confidence for managers and stakeholders that the results are robust. And so again, from a policy, under, policy perspective, I can totally understand that, but it also seems like you know, it's pretty directly saying, you know, yes, we do want to use a different standard of proof for different kinds of outputs. And so you know, I just thought it would be worth looking into, like what's that gonna do to, um, our FMP-wide advice and whether it sort of meets the assumptions of our P-star sigma model. Um, you know, I should also say, so not just managers, assessors and reviewers are also responding to these sorts of pressures. You know, an assessor may want to avoid going to a mop-up or having to redo their assessment. Uh, reviewers may be happy to just get things over and done with. Um, conversely, you know, the opposite might be true. An assessor might get really dug into their way of doing things. Um, a reviewer might just you know, be very skeptical and um, not inclined, or might be sort of pessimistic and not inclined to accept really favorable assessments. Um, but you know, regardless, I think you know, thinking back to the warnings about you know, sort of unintentional p-hacking, we do need to be we need to be careful about are we ever sort of 
constructing post hoc reasoning to support whatever outcome works out the best for us. And also, if we do sort of decide to redo an assessment, do we need to be careful not to sort of make directed requests where we only request the sort of changes we think will either improve or decrease status depending on what sort of our motivations might be? Um, but then also, so even if we are you know, doing a really good job of weeding out the less accurate assessments, not because they are too pessimistic, but just because we're actually able to tell these are the sort of more problematic assessments. And even if on average, by redoing those assessments, we improve them, could we still be sort of creating a bias through some process kind of analogous to p-hacking? And so first I'll show just a sort of very preliminary straw person argument I came up with just to show the PFMC and also just to sort of convince myself, like, am I just making up a problem here where it's not really, you know, is there not really gonna be any perceptible numeric effect of these kinds of things? So let's just assume we start out with a set of what we call category one assessments. These are the full assessments that include the most sources of data. And so let's assume that those are me median unbiased. So on the log scale, the ratio between the true and the assessed OFL will follow this nice log normal distribution with median zero and sigma of 0 0.5. That corresponds to a log normal distribution on the arithmetic scale with a median of one and a coefficient of variation of about 53%. And then the 45th percentile or P star buffer about 0.94. Okay, so now suppose that we're actually able to really skillfully select out which are the assessments that are doing the worst job and that are underestimating biomass by the largest amount. So we take away sort of the right-hand tail of these distributions. And so for now, that leaves us with a you know, distribution that's no longer symmetric on either scale. Um, and it has a different median and a different sigma. And if we then assume that when we redo these assessments, we do it in an unbiased fashion with the same sort of overall accuracy we had before, we can model what happens if we add those back in. And so we now get this kind of skewed log scale distribution, which now has a negative median and a slightly larger sigma or slightly smaller sigma, which means on the arithmetic scale, we now have a median of about 0.9 and a coefficient of variation of about 40% rather than the old 53%. And note that the 45th percentile buffer has now moved down to 0 0.85. And so what that means is, um, you know, after doing this kind of adjustment to just the more pessimistic assessments, when we look at the whole FMPY level, you know, it seems like we're actually expecting to have an OFL that on median is too high by about 11%. Um, or similarly, you know, if we still use the old PSTAR 0.45 buffer of 0.94, we're coming up with an ABC that's about one point or about 10% too high. Um, and so if we apply the standard buffer of 0.94 to an OFL that's 11% too high, we come out actually about 5% above the true OFL. So we think we're being precautionary when we apply this buffer, but we're actually being the opposite of precautionary. Um, and so one way you can think about that, that's actually sort of like picking a P star of 0.54 when you think you're picking P star of 0.45. Um, and certainly there are a lot of caveats in this overly simplistic model that were you know, brought to my attention uh, you know, and I've worked on addressing many of these. Uh, first of all, you know, just, it was pretty arbitrary that I came up with the idea of reassessing 20% of the assessments. Um, but when you look at what happened in June, 2021, we actually started out um, at, at least taking a second look at more than 20%. In the end, we changed one out of 11 or 9%, and then an additional two or about 22%, we're gonna take another, or they're gonna, those assessments are gonna be redone in the next cycle. So that was an arbitrary, but perhaps not totally unreasonable percent of assessments to be redone. Um, suspiciously high results may get extra scrutiny too. Um, I'm not super familiar with the details of this anymore, but it was pointed out to me that for Pacific Ocean Perch in 2017, um, we had almost the reverse pattern where the SSC wanted to take a second look at an assessment that seemed um, to be sort of implying status much higher than we were expecting. Um, but overall, this does seem to be less common. Um, and then also, and this was a really interesting thing, interesting thing to think about, is like it's not really realistic to say that if we redo an assessment, we're completely starting over from scratch, we're gonna get a completely independent amount of error in that. Um, you know, there's 
possibly it's going to be the same assessor doing both the original and read on assessment. Certainly a lot of the same data will be in both. Um, but still, it seems like we might expect some kind of reversion towards the mean or median. Um, as I mentioned, it might be that you know, there'll be sort of results motivated uh, requests for including certain data sources or for changing certain parts of the model structure. Um, and then also, you know, the assessors may not want to go through this process of meeting after meeting after meeting again. So, and so they might either consciously or subconsciously make some model choices they hope will sort of lead to an assessment that the reviewers and managers find more acceptable. But so I have been working on a model that I think can capture a few more of these aspects. So instead of sort of treating each assessment as a random draw from the potential errors, what if we say, you know, let's model the error in an assessment as the, um, the log scale sum or the arithmetic scale product of two different error components. So one component, which I'll call the sort of stock specific error, that's due to things that aren't going to change or aren't going to change a lot from one assessment to the next. So like the data are for the most part going to be the same, even if you know certain data sets might get included or excluded. You know, you're not going to have a completely different fishery independent survey. Um, there are a lot of assumptions that are sort of baked into the way we do things and are unlikely to be unlikely to cha be changed in the read on assessment. Um, but then there are also some assessment specific factors you know, things like exactly which data sets get included, how do we weight different data, which parameters do we choose to estimate rather than fixed. And so these sorts of things, I think, potentially will get redone when there's a new assessment. And so I think there's sort of, it might make sense to model the error as one component that um, is static when an assessment is redone and another component that's redone. And so for what I'll show today, I sort of wanted to work on the assumption that we know the overall level of uncertainty. That's the sigma we've already adopted. And so if we assume that the total error is described by that overall sigma, then we can use the equation for the sum of variance to come up with, okay, how do we solve for um, different levels of sort of intrinsic stock specific variance and then um, assessment specific variance that will sum together to the same overall level of uncertainty. Um, and then if we want to simulate a system where we assess a bunch of stocks and then reassess only some of them, the way we can simulate this is do a bunch of simulated assessment outputs where for each stock, we draw the stock specific error term only once, but then we draw this assessment specific error term once for the first pass of the process and then redraw it for any assessment that we model being redone. And so I looked at various different scenarios for how we break down what we currently think our total sigma of 0 0.5 is into different levels of the overall variance coming from assessment specific factors versus uh, stock intrinsic factors. Um, and I also looked at sort of different scenarios for did we choose the stocks to reassess at random? Did we choose them in an informed way? So sort of picking out the ones that did badly but um, picking out the ones that were inaccurate in either direction, or do we pick out the stocks to be redone in sort of an informed way, so picking out the ones that are not very accurate, but also a directional way, so picking out the ones that are inaccurate, but also inaccurate in the direction of being unduly constraining. Um, and then I also looked at, you know, what are the effects of subjecting a different proportion of the assessments to this extra scrutiny? And so, you know, first, and it's sort of a nice sanity check on the model, I just simulated a base case where we have just an unbiased set of category one assessments, in which case, you know, the ratio between true OFL and assessed OFL follows this nice symmetric normal distribution with properties like we've already discussed about. And then reassuringly, anytime I model the scenario where we assessed or reassess stocks just at random, um, regardless of what fraction of stocks I modeled being reassessed, regardless of how much of the assessment, how much of the variance I attributed to assessment specific versus stock specific factors, got the same nice symmetric distribution back. Um, if I simulated a sort of informed way of picking out the less accurate assessments, but doing that in a symmetric way, so picking out both the overly pessimistic and the overly optimistic assessments, still get a nice symmetric distribution back out. Although note, you know, sigma has gone down, it's a tighter distribution now, 
And so we can actually use slightly larger buffers or you know, less conservative buffers um, and get sort of the same probability of overfishing. Um, but when we start simulating scenarios where we are skillful in selecting which assessments to redo, but also picking the more pessimistic assessments to redo, that's when we start getting an asymmetric distribution. So we're sort of moving assessments out of the right-hand tail and into the left-hand tail. And so by doing that, we're now getting a median less than one. So you know, again, that's implying that the true OFL is likely on, you know, at least 50% of the time, the true OFL is less than the one coming out of our assessment. And we should be using smaller numbers for our buffer than we're currently using. Um, but you know, that's with 30% of assessments being redone, which seems you know, probably on the high end of what's reasonable to think about. In terms of the percent of variance attributable to assessment specific factors, I'm not really sure what a, a reasonable number to assume there is. And you know, maybe people listening to this talk have some ideas. Um, but also think about it some more, just sort of the way we estimate sigma now we might actually really only be accounting for the assessment specific variance. So it might make sense to sort of model some scenarios where the assessment specific variance is fixed with sigma at 0 0.5, and then you add various levels of stock specific variance on top of that. Um, but for now, the results I'm showing are just breaking down or you know, looking at different scenarios where we look at different fractions of assessments redone and then fix sigma at 0 0.5, but change what percent of that variance we attribute to stock specific factors, uh, which is on the right, or to assessment specific factors, which is on the left. And so um, here I'm sort of showing if we do pick out just what we think are the more pessimistic assessments and we do this skillfully, um, depending on you know, how that assessment variance breaks down and depending on what fraction of assessments we're redoing, you know, that median is going to be less than one and potentially by a fairly consequential amount. You know, um, recall that, you know, our default P star of 0 0.45 approach uses a multiplier of 0.94. And so if we're redoing, you know, more than about 10% of our assessments and there's a really strong assessment specific contribu contribution to the variance, then our P star of 0.45 multiplier is a best at best risk neutral and may not even be risk neutral if we're either redoing a lot of assessments or there's really a lot of assessment specific variance. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of shown how just the right multiplier to get an unbiased OFL changes. Uh, this graph shows what the right sort of multiplier to be using for a PCR 0.45 is. Um, again, remember the default multiplier is 0.94 and so, you know, there are, there are certainly regions in this graph where it seems like we should be using um, a multiplier that is smaller than that. And, you know, smaller even by the amount, you know, if 0.94 is usefully or importantly smaller than one, we think it's like meaningful to apply that buffer. And it seems like if numbers are smaller than that by, you know, five to 10 percent, seems like that might be important to account for, too. Um, so yeah, and you know, again, you know, can sort of come up with scenarios that I think are at least somewhat plausible where, you know, we really should be using the default of, we really should be using the multiplier that corresponds to P star of 0.4 and just to be sort of getting back to the point of using, or to get the result we think we are getting when we use the default multiplier for 0.45. Um, and you're showing, you know, if we want to be more precautionary and use a P star of 0.40, then the kind of multipliers we should be looking at get even smaller. Um, conversely, you know, as I mentioned, if we are sort of symmetric in the way we pick out assessments to redo and we do that in a skillful way, we can actually tighten that distribution. Um, and so we can actually use slightly larger multipliers. Um, but no, you know, even though the sort of number of contour lines on this graph is similar to the last one, the actual spacing between the contours is a lot closer. Um, so, you know, the sort of symmetric scrutiny might lead to a situation where we can use slightly higher multipliers, but the differences are not of the same order as the kind of as the kind of differences implied by the asymmetric uh, scrutiny. So, sort of a couple of potential take-homes to take or a couple of potential take home messages from this modeling, at least from my perspective, is that if we're just randomly picking assessments to redo, 
that's kind of a waste of time and resources, and it's going to delay uh, new assessments that might be more useful, but it's hopefully not introducing any bias. Um, but conversely, if we are able to sort of skillfully select the least accurate assessments, well, and if we can do this, if we can do this, and if we do it in a symmetric way, then also we're not going to be introducing bias. Um, but it may not be terribly worthwhile to do. You know, we can use a slightly higher multiplier when we go from AB, from OFL to ABC, but it's you know not very big change. Um, I guess we can also say, you know, that might be a good thing in the sense that some individual assessments are being improved, um, but are we really benefiting that much from doing so? Conversely, if we're able to skillfully select the assessments that are underestimating OFLs by a large amount, then it seems like that will lead to a bias in the FMP-wide distribution of OFLs. And so that suggests that, you know, if more than about 10% of assessments are being revised, that you know that probably does change the multipliers we should be using by sort of an appreciable amount or you know by an amount that's comparable to if not even greater than the amount of change that corresponds to the choice of p star of 0.45 versus 0 0.40 um, and i think you know in practice i think we're somewhat skillful in identifying the less accurate assessments but there's probably we're not perfect at that so we're probably in practice somewhere in between the sort of random selection scenario and the skillful selection scenario. Um, you know, which leads me to think like, you know, maybe it's actually not a huge problem to sort of redo problematic assessments every now and then, um, but it seems like we need to be doing this, you know, pretty judiciously. Um, and I think ideally we should be making sure that we're applying the same kind of scrutiny to what seem like potentially overly optimistic assessments as well. So sort of, you know, circling back to those very first few papers I showed on p-hacking, you know, it seems like, you know, the sky wasn't quite falling in the scientific literature quite to the extent that some people thought early on, um, but there were sort of non-trivial impacts on uh, meta-analyses and that type of thing. And so I think you know, we may be in a somewhat similar situation here where I don't think the sky is falling based on our current approach to prioritizing assessments and redoing them. Uh, but maybe we do need to be a little careful about not getting into a situation where we are causing real problems in terms of FMP-wide bias. And so, you know, thinking about potential solutions, you know, if we think about how has the broader scientific community responded to concerns about p-hacking, um, you know, there have been a few things proposed. One is, you know, that people just really need to have clear a priori hypotheses, um, both when they design studies and then when they select candidate covariates for their statistical analyses, and that people should be transparent in how they choose the statistical models they apply and what sort of significance criteria they will use. Um, Another potentially really strong um, protection would be what's called pre-registration. So sort of if people at the stage of applying for funding to do an experiment, or even you know some journals are experimenting with a system where you write the introduction to your paper before you've even done the work. And you know if you have a well-motivated question and then you lay out some methods that make sense, then the journal agrees, yes, we will publish this paper you know, regardless of whether you get statistical significance in the end or not. Um, also, you can do things like adjusting for multiple tests. So you can uh, use a different significance criterion based on how many tests you performed. Um, it's also been suggested that maybe um, just using a more stringent standard for statistical significance than P less than 0.05, um, that could do a lot to reduce um, the amount or the number of sort of false positives we find. Because it's sort of, Relatively easy to p-hack your way to p of 0.05, it's pretty hard to p-hack your way to really tiny p-values. And so somewhat relatedly, um, you know, thinking, are there sort of analogies to each of these in the assessment process? So, you know, could we sort of, like sort of similar to the having of a prior hypothesis, should we do a good job of not just selecting stocks, but then the boundaries between stocks and which data to include, and then what the standards we're going to apply in our review. Can we sort of select all of these things in advance rather than adjusting them based on what the management implica implications of the assessment outputs are? Um, 
I think we need to focus on what's the scientific support for different mo models or different model approaches, not the management implications of those models. I think we want to be sure don't adopt a system where we sort of pull the plug or stop an assessment partway through if it looks like it's going to give an unfavorable result. Um, but then I think, you know, there might be some merit in using something sort of like that model I showed, you know, probably um, something a little bit more sophisticated. But can we come up with a way that just sort of says, okay, we can keep on, you know, singling or remanding some assessments to take another look at. But depending on how often we do that, we need to make some adjustment to the buffers we use in, in implementing this PSTAR signal system. Um, and then sort of similar to this idea of just accepting a more stringent p-value than 0.05, should we have just, can we establish just really stringent standards for what, what conditions need to be met before the SSC or whatever review body will agree to reviewing or to taking another look at sort of a redone assessment, but then also for prioritization, should we have really stringent standards for what, you know, what level of priority do we need to have to say, reassess this stock right away versus assess some other stock that's in need of assessment and hasn't been looked at in a long time. Um, and so I do have a few more slides, but I thought I'd just sort of pause here if there were at this point, any questions or any brief discussion points anybody wanted to bring up? Um, but if not, I'll just sort of plow on and we can hopefully discuss a little bit more at the end. Um, but at least on my end, I'm not seeing any questions or chat. I don't know, Emily, if you can sort of confirm I'm seeing or I'm not seeing what I should. I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Great. Okay. <coughs> So um, you know, on the sort of idea of coming up with these standards for redoing or revising assessment, um, I recently came across, apparently the New England Fishery Management Council um, apparently uh, had a practice of sending quite a few assessments back for reconsideration. And so that actually led to a scenario where the New England Fishery Management Council and their SSC established a fairly restrictive set of rules that says, we're only going to take another look at an ABC if one of these four criteria is met. Um, and interestingly, you know, criterion one here, the failure to follow terms of reference is actually something that um, would not have applied. Well, none of these would have applied, I think, to any of the assessments that the Pacific Council asked for a second look at this last cycle. And in fact, one sort of sticking point with those data moderate assessments was that there were data that some people wanted included in those assessments, but including those data would have been against the terms of reference for data moderate assessments. So it's sort of the opposite motivation here that rather than there being a problem that the terms of reference weren't followed, um, the problem in the Pacific Council was actually uh, the council was not happy with fo having followed the terms of reference for those particular assessments. Um, I also came across this in a uh, great paper by Scott Crossan that I very much recommend to anybody who's involved in the management world, um, where he mentions, you know, in the Mid-Atlantic Council, they had a sort of similar problem or, you know, similar situation where councils were, you know, not accepting the ABC recommendations from their SSC and asking for another look or, you know, a different control rule approach. And so, again, the Mid-Atlantic came up with a rule that said they would only take another look at sort of endorsed assessments if either some new data is found or some actual error was found. Um, and I kind of wish I had read this paper before um, the 2011 or 2021 assessment cycle that I was part of because that might have led me to um, some better proposals for a situation we found ourselves in. Where, so circling back, so in June of 2021, um, when you know, the Pacific SSC had endorsed all 11 of these assessments, but in September, the SSC was asked to take a look at them again. And the SSC said, again, we endorse all five. Um, but we did identify a few issues that do, do potentially merit some further consider consideration at this mop-up meeting. And then, um, you know, with sort of very limited time to come up with our statement of what are we going to do, we sort of settled on some kind of compromise language that said the SSC will reconsider the assessments 
if the outputs of these revised models are and then we just said substantially inconsistent without really defining what substantially inconsistent is. Um, and so I came up with a sort of straw man proposal for what might the criteria for a substantial difference be. And so here I'm just going to sort of recycle a presentation I gave to the SFC, Pacific SFC Groundfish Subcommittee last September. Um, and so my premise going into this, which is sort of similar to the premise I had for the talk I gave here, is that the SSC has a responsibility to provide unbiased, risk-neutral, and policy-neutral advice. And so, you know, there are other advisory bodies and management teams in the council process, and there's the public itself. And all of these, you know, groups have their roles and responsibilities too. And I don't, you know, in any way mean to say that what they do are, is not important, that those are not considerations that should go into management. I think those considerations absolutely should go into management, but I also think it's a mistake to try to build those considerations into the scientific advice being delivered by the scientists. And so, yes, we've discussed, doing assessments require a lot of interacting decisions and assumptions. And so, and we, we do, we know that we can have more or less equally supported models that nevertheless yield fairly different results. Um, so the way we originally came up with our sigma, although you know, there have been improvements to this since, but the way we originally came up with these sigma values was through this meta-analysis that looked at what were the sort of common year biomass estimates coming out of different assessments done for the same species through time. And you know, we found that you know, for the same stock and estimating biomass for the same year, different assessments that, you know, different review bodies had found totally acceptable were coming up with fairly different biomass estimates, you know, with a coefficient of variation on the order of 36 or 38 percent. So I think we just need to accept that there is a fair bit of uncertainty in even the best model outputs. And, you know, anytime we redo an assessment, we are likely to get a different answer but whether it's meaningfully different, I think is you know, something we need to think about carefully. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, I think there's you know, a danger that if we redo assessments until we get a result we like, you know, we then like, can fall into a trap of just sort of cherry picking, okay, the, re this, the set of changes to this model that led to the result I like, those are clearly the changes we should have made. Um, and I think you know, we can easily fall into some sort of logical traps if we let ourselves do that. Um, and so I think the best way to avoid that is through having objective, repeatable, and policy neutral criteria, either for what constitutes a substantial difference, which was a sort of position we found ourselves in, um, or just, you know, something like the New England and uh, Mid-Atlantic Council, which is sort of say, like, we will only take a second look under certain conditions. And if those conditions aren't met, we're just going to avoid this whole potential peak hacking problem. Um, and so what I proposed as ways of deciding whether or not a new assessment is substantially different from the old one, um, first, there's sort of a couple preliminary steps that I think you need to take before you even take a deep look at the new model. So one, just make sure that any new data we added are representative and reliable and are a sufficient quality and quantity to be informative. Um, verify that any re, um, changes in the model that people have requested are changes that are mechanistically plausible. And then verify before going deeply into the results that any of the new models or new model runs have acceptable diagnostics. So, you know, they converged, the residual patterns don't look horrible, uh, the retrospective pattern doesn't look horrible, things like that. Um, and as sort of luck would have it, um, none of the assessments that the Pacific Council was tasked with taking another look at none of the changed assessments really met those standards and so we didn't have to think too deeply about the steps i'll propose after this you know, as i mentioned there was one assessment where we did uh, change the base state of nature based on assumptions around catchability of the survey but that really wasn't a different assessment model it was just sort of a different choice of what's the sort of most plausible assumption for this highly uncertain parameter um, but assuming you have a redone assessment that sort of meets these preliminary steps I would propose calculate the terminal biomass coming out of that alternative model and compare that to the terminal biomass coming out of the model that was previously endorsed. And then calculate the divergence on the log scale between those two assessments, so the log ratio. Um, 
And so that puts that difference between the two models on the same scale as sigma, which is our sort of well-established metric of assessment uncertainty. Um, and when we do this, you know, I think the sigma we want to compare it to is the one that was based on biomass alone, which comes out of this Ralston et al. 2011 paper. Uh, there have been nice and I think you know, very useful extensions to our sigma estimates recently that probably more fully capture the uncertainty in the OFL. But I think for this purpose, we really want to look at just uncertainty in the biomass. And then my proposal is, you know, once we have the difference put in the sort of same scale we can use to compare with sigma, then ask ourselves, um, if the difference between the original and redone assessment is smaller than sigma, then you know, that's well within the expected level of noise for accepted assessments. And so my recommendation, which you know, not everybody is going to agree with, would be just stick with the previously endorsed assessment, and that's BSIA, or best scientific information available, uh, and that's adequate to inform management and status determinations. And then um, my recommendation, which you know, even I'm a little fuzzy on, is like, okay, let's say that the difference is a little bit bigger than sigma, but it's smaller than two sigma. So I would say that's, you know, somewhat unexpectedly large level of divergence, but it's not an extreme level of divergence. And so, you know, maybe I always say like, don't throw out the old assessment. You know, that old assessment is still best available science. It can still inform management. Um, and maybe you don't want to use it to inform status if you, you know, take in what are the policy consequences of getting status wrong in each direction. Um, and maybe you want to prioritize a full assessment in the next cycle. Um, whereas, you know, if the new or redone assessment differs from the old one by more than two sigma, I think that's a pretty large divergence where that really does cast doubt on the original assessment. And so, you know, as long as, you know, the pathway of getting to that revised assessment was reasonable, I think if the difference is that large, then yes, you, you probably do want to give serious thought to abandoning the original assessment and adopting the alternative one. And I think you do want to prioritize, you know, carefully doing a full assessment of that stock in the next cycle. Um, but I think also, you know, a difference of two sigma, hopefully you're not going to encounter that terribly often. And if you do encounter that, um, then, you know, I think you do, you do have some real concern. And so, you know, exactly where you draw the cutoff, is it one sigma, is it two sigma, is it the 50th percentile? I think all of those are you know, great things to discuss. But first, you know, I got, um, it was suggested to me that that approach that I recommended there was um, irrelevant and arbitrary. Um, and I can certainly see why somebody might say that, but then I think my counter argument would be, well, I mean, in terms of you know, arbitrary, I think biomass is probably the most fundamental output of an assessment. So looking at biomass uh, seems like a pretty logical thing to do from my perspective. Um, and, you know, the sigma values that we come up with for biomass, at least for our category one assessments, you know, that did come from a pretty thoroughly reviewed meta-analysis that was, you know, more or less replicated when people made an attempt to update it. Um, you know, when we get into the sort of so-called category two or data moderate assessments, you know, maybe our value of sigma for those kinds of assessments is not quite so well supported. And then I would certainly say, you know, we don't have a whole lot of basis for our sigma that we use for category three assessments. So I think really, I would say this is an approach to use or to consider using for category one and category two assessments, probably not for category three. Um, but so category three are these sort of what we call data limited assessments where you know, the prospects for redoing a data limited assessment in a very different way may be pretty limited anyway. Um, and then, you know, whether or not, well, so my sort of initial proposal is to use one sigma and two sigma, like that's based on, you know, a pretty common approach where people often use plus or minus one standard deviation or plus or minus one standard error as just sort of like a typical level of uncertainty. And using plus or minus two sigma is pretty commonly used to say like this is really it's unlikely to be outside of that. Um, but you know certainly you know some other threshold like 0.67 sigma, which would be the central 50%, or 1.64, which would be the central 90%. I think you know that certainly could merit a priority consideration. Um, but again, I would be careful not to choose after the fact. You know the sort of 
for lack of a better word, the significance level that just corresponds to getting the management outcome that a particular party wants. Um, and so that's sort of how far I've gotten on thinking about this problem. I am sort of hoping that I can inspire people either to discuss now or over some follow-up conversations of like, what might some next steps be? Is anybody interested in working with me on this kind of thing? Um, and so one thing I would think about is like, is there any value in doing some sort of literature review on what factors predict which the sort of remanded assessments are, the ones that the council requests and look at, or what predicts which assessments get sent to this mop-up panel, what predicts which assessments do not get accepted. Um, another thing I've been thinking about is, so I've sort of looked at like what might p-hacking or something like p-hacking do to our FMP-wide advice with respect to overfishing limits. Would it be possible to do something similar looking at our estimates of status or depletion? You know, in particular, is it reasonable to assume that the true depletion to assess depletion ratio would also follow a log normal distribution? If so, what should sigma for that distribution be? Um, it might be larger because now we have uncertainty not just in our estimate of current biomass, but also the estimate of unfished biomass that we're comparing it to. It might be smaller if there's correlation in the estimate of both the current and unfished biomass, or it might be similar if those two factors sort of luckily cancel each other out. I'm also wondering, you know, if you've looked into the literature at all around p-hacking, you might see the use of approaches like funnel plots or p-curves, where basically people look at, you know, when you look at the literature across a field, do you see a lot of test statistics that are piling up right at that critical value, uh, which could be suggestive of either publication bias or some sort of, you know, uh, multiple testing or p-hacking type approach. Um, and so, you know, could we do something similar looking at do our estimates of depletion tend to pile up right around either the biomass target or right above the threshold for being overfished? Um, but I think, you know, one caveat we would need to keep in mind if we did that sort of analysis is, is it actually sort of, is that exactly the pattern we expect to see if management is successful? So we sort of expect successful management to drive biomass towards the target. And we sort of expect successful management to be reactive and drive biomass above the overfish threshold if it gets too close to it. So I'm not sure if like a sort of p-curve approach would really work. Um, and sort of similarly, you know, people have criticized some of these approaches for looking at p-hacking, saying, well, if people are actually doing a good job of doing preliminary studies and power analyses ahead of time, people should be choosing their sample sizes in such a way that, you know, they're not needlessly collecting too many samples, they're collecting just the right amount of samples relative to what they sort of think is a relevant, relevant effect size and what they think the likely level of noise in their data is. So I think, you know, P curves are interesting to look at, but may not quite be the smoking gun we might hope for. Um, and I'm also interested in people's thoughts, you know, is anything that I've put out here sort of the basis of an interesting paper or, you know, something that should be distributed in some other venue? And if so, what might the appropriate venue or journal recommendation be? Um, would trying to publish this, should that involve developing the quantitative model further, building more things into it, or is it actually sort of more of a perspective piece that might be sort of a purely qualitative discussion that sort of talks generally about the issue and about potential analogies and sort of less focus on the quantitative modeling per se. Um, so with that, I'll say, Thank you to everybody and would welcome any questions or feedback. And I will turn my camera back on for hopefully a little bit of discussion. So thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you, Will. Um, I have a couple of thoughts in the question box that I'll kind of read out. Um, Lewis Barnett says, really interesting analogy and thank you. Um, Ian had to leave, um, but he said his sense is that the correlation between the original and the reconsidered assessment will be high unless you put in lots more work, i.e. new data, new authors, new methods. So getting uh, reconsidered results that are more independent from the original will lead to even fewer total assessments conducted. Um, and then, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, Jim Ianelli also has a question. I will see if I can unmute him. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for whatever reason, I cannot see the questions. So, but yeah, first of all, I think Ian's points. So yeah, it's too bad Ian had to leave. I think yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Um, and yeah, but yeah, and so I mean that is you know even emphasizing even more that sort of trade-off of if we really want to redo these assessments, then we're really going to have to you know delay getting potentially really needed assessments for others. Um, yeah, uh, Jim, I, yeah. yeah, Jim, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Well, re really good talk, really pro thought provoking. Um, one comment, just, um, you know, we're we're in the best assessment paradigm through all of this, right? And right. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, you know, more management procedure type approaches, management strategies. And I have a couple of follow-ups on where I think this stuff would be really applicable. Um, but it just first, if there's like, how would you see this working in an actual management procedure context where you you your quotas are based on data that are tested via simulations in an operating model type of context? I know that's a big shift, but eventually we might get there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, sort of, well, one, I guess partly not something I've thought about a whole lot from this particular perspective. And partly, you know, I sort of glommed onto the P star sigma because, you know, for all its warts, it is something that I think is like statistically pretty straightforward and sort of is making, um, you know, something you can kind of interpret in a frequentist statistic, statistician kind of way. Um, so I just sort of thought it was, you know, convenient place to start the model from. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of how you would actually apply this to a management procedure approach, I'm not really sure. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts. I mean, one thing I was thinking about earlier is, well, you know, sort of raising this p-hacking concern of like, and also, you know, sort of, do we have more than a p-star probability that our ABCs are too high? Um, maybe that's okay. You know, maybe, it's okay to have a greater than 50% chance that our ABC is too high because we're unlikely to actually attain that ABC. And so, yeah, if there's some sort of way to build in, you know, sort of more realistic simulation of the whole process and say, we don't care if our ABC is too high or has, you know, more than 50% chance of being too high. We care if our reasonable expectation of what cash will actually be has more than 50% chance of being too high. Um, and so, yeah, maybe that could borrow something from the management procedure approach. But I'd be interested, yeah, if you have sort of thoughts on how this might sort of apply to like just, I don't know if you're thinking of any sort of like decisions about how you structure your management procedure simulation, um, you know, how different stakeholders affect what gets built into an MSC versus what doesn't. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested to talk more with you about that at some point. Yeah, if, 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 if I can, i just um, share experience that we're having for for a bluefin tuna, southern bluefin tuna, where management procedures have gone through two sets of enactment, so we've had two separate management procedures over the last decade, and in between, they set they set up a procedure that's been selected based on kind of objectives that are broad ranging, but um, once they're selected, we do assessments in the intervening years. And those assessments involve exceptional circumstances. In a couple of slides ago, it felt like what you were doing there was coming up with a way is how far out is the most recent best assessment from the you know from the new one or, or vice versa. And and so that's kind of an exceptional circumstance and requires action. And so that's what that kind of reminded me of that process. So just to reiterate, they have a data-driven tested management procedure that's in place. So everyone knows what's going to happen. It's very transparent. But in the intervening years, a big test is to whether any new information is kind of outside the realm of what was evaluated when the procedures were tested by simulation. So that's kind of the exceptional circumstance. So just if I, just to explain a little more, the the operating model is conditioned on data but has a lot of additional plausible complexity that you might not include 
in a best assessment context. Um, but you, you want to include that in testing a procedure to make sure it's robust to kind of crap that's going to happen. Anyway, I, I thought that was really cool and could be something that would be really useful in that context of, you know, your whole process of selecting or, or rejecting something because it's way outside the previous assessment. I thought that was great. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Jen. I don't see any questions at the moment. Um, I had one though. I was curious, and if you hadn't read the paper, um, I can always go back about the Mid Atlantic Council um, deciding they weren't going to uh, review some of these um, assessments. Uh, I guess I was curious as someone who doesn't have as much experience with the council process. Is that something that the SSC is um, able to do in their own bylaws or? Would it require some like extra um, policy to allow us to do? Yeah, um, I'm trying to pull it. Well, so first I'll pull up that slide partly just to put the reference back up there for that paper. Um, let's see. So yeah, I guess he doesn't say it here, but I think somewhere in this paper he sort of talks about how like. That had to be a mutual decision by both the SSC and their council to establish these rules for when it would happen or not. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I don't know like what you know sort of ability an SSC would have of its own you know, sort of independent volition to sort of say like no, we refuse to take another look at this. Um, I suspect in most regions they would be unlikely to do that unless there was some sort of pre-written agreement um but yeah i mean i think it's sort of yeah i mean you're sort of asking i think you're asking a very good question it's just not one that i know the answer to i think it's probably more a matter of law and policy um which especially if we're being recorded i don't want to speculate too much on those things uh i have a um hand raised edward did you question i can unmute you hi can you hear me yes hey well um hey, so I, I guess i had I lowered my hand because i want to think about this a little bit more but one of the things with your proposed criterion with comparing the biomass um i thought maybe it would be one potential outcome of redoing an assessment even if the biomass didn't change much your understanding of the strength of recent recruitment may change within a couple extra years of data, for example. Um, so I was just thinking in building into your criterion whether or not some sort of for forecast element or consideration of what the forecasted biomass is and how those differences are, rather than just biomass at that time step. Um, was, that's what popped into my head, was that you are potentially getting more information about short-term changes due to recruitment yeah and that's that's a great point um it also sort of makes me think a little bit about how i was saying you know let's just look at biomass and then let's tie it to the ralston et al sigma because they did sigma in just biomass um we now have that really cool work that chantal and owen has done looking at you know how should our perception of or, you know how should our sigma increase through time to account for sort of Create a projection uncertainty over time. And so maybe there's sort of some way of, yeah, considering not just the terminal biomass, but also the trajectory. And then, yeah, maybe using the revised sigma values to account for that. Um, let's see. Yeah. And I guess, you know, one of, well, yeah, I mean, I think certainly there is more coming out of an assessment than just the biomass. Um, the biomass seems like an easy thing to come up with a, you know, pre existing standard for but i certainly agree there are other considerations that might change between assessments also i mean i suppose it's also possible you might get the same current biomass but of like somehow have a really changed perception of what unfished biomass was and therefore sort of change your depletion without even changing your biomass by much but yeah good point right. yeah i'd like to talk to you about that a little bit further at some point thanks i have a a uh, question in the chat from Kristen Marshall. Uh, great talk, Will. How do you think 
the potential for revisiting assessments or requests for doing so might change with the shifting ocean conditions, stock distributions, et cetera. Is this a risk that we are likely to see more of in the future? Hmm. Great questions. Um, so I guess there's maybe sort of two aspects to how I might answer that. I mean, one is I think just are shifting distributions going to lead to more requests for redone assessments? Um, that's sort of, you know, say, you know, species shift in or out of particular stakeholders sort of geographic range and they either get more or less fish as a result of that. Um, I can see there being calls to do a, or to do a new assessment to sort of capture either of those things. Um, there may just be concern about um, having reduced opportunity for fish moving away and so wanting to sort of make sure that's really the case before accepting any reduction in opportunity. You can also see, yeah, there being calls that, hey, a bunch of fish have moved into our area so we really need to redo this assessment so we're not being unnecessarily constrained on the high end. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of also interesting to think about like, um, you know, I've sort of been coming at this from this perspective of there may not be a whole lot of value in sort of redoing an assessment on the short term because, you know, what's really changed from one assessment to the next. If we get into a point of sort of really rapid environmental change, um, maybe there is a better argument for redoing assessments on a shorter time scale. Although, you know, sort of the trade-off Ian brought up just gets even worse then because it's sort of, there'll be a whole huge priority to do a lot of new assessments to account for a lot of species moving around. And so will we have less capability to respond to these changes in the environment if we're just re busy, if we're just busy redoing assessments that we don't like the outputs of? Um, so yeah, thanks, Kristen. I have a, um, Lewis has his hand raised. I'm gonna unmute you, Lewis. Can't hear you, Lewis. Are you hearing Emily? I'm not hearing anything. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, Owen also has his hand raised. I'm going to unmute him. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I was, yes, yes. I, I'm having a little connectivity problem, so if I drop off, that's that's why. Um, yeah, going back to the question of uh, you know using biomass, um, you know there could be cases just where you have, for instance, an absolute biomass estimate that's kind of pegging the assessment, but then there's an uncertainty, more uncertainty in productivity, which could really change your MSY. So I think it might be important to look at, have at least another thing to look at along with change in biomass. Um, in terms of environment, I think the sort of thing we see with some CPS where we also base uh, the harvest rate or the productivity based on environmental indices, you could have a case where the, that's changing rapidly, but the biomass isn't. And again, the change in the in the harvest rate or the uh, would change a lot, and the biomass wouldn't. So um, those are some things to consider as well. Yeah, totally agree. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, and I got to drop off for another meeting, but yeah, that was great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Lewis is going to try typing his question. All right. And yeah, and I'm not seeing either questions or chat. So if you could read it, that would be great. Sure. How, how about my audio? Is it fixed now? Oh, yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey, well, yeah, great, great talk. Very, very thought provoking. Um, I had a question. I don't know if you can really apply it here, but I was curious, you know, as another case to go along with your, your random um, reperformance of assessments, you know, it, can you develop a base case where you you don't revisit any assessment? So that's more consistent with where we're headed in terms of resources to review assessments and to conduct assessments. Yeah, I guess, so what does it mean to never revisit? You mean never assess the same stock ever again? I mean, partly, you know, one thing I've struggled with all along is like, what constitutes redoing an assessment? You know, is just saying it to a mop-up panel the same as rejecting it 
outright and either asking for a new assessment within that cycle or saying like assess this right away at the next opportunity um, and that you know so those were sort of what i was thinking of as redoing the assessment but like yeah i mean what if we redo the assessment in four years like that sometimes yeah. things to have changed but yeah um, exactly i guess you have to you'd have to make some assumption about what's the status quo we do revisit these assessments every whatever two to four years um, so we're, we're already revisiting them in that sense, but without wholesale reconstruction of assumptions and you know major structural changes. Yeah, well, I think at least in the Pacific realm, there's sort of it's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, like we don't tend to accept projections more than ten years out. So you can maybe yeah, model something where we never reassess within ten years. Um, that's for ground fish. I mean, CPS, we reassess more often than that. But, um, but yeah, interesting to think about. I don't have any questions or hand raised at the moment. Uh, All right. Well, again, thanks everyone for your attention. And you know, if you have any further ideas, feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from people. Yeah, so uh, there are no more questions. Thank you all for attending. This was a great talk, Will. Um, yeah, have a nice Tuesday afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye.